pocket if you want. All right, it's uh, time to get started with this uh, session. So we have two speakers in this session talking about uh, Dirac materials. The first is uh, Oscar Wafek, who will tell us about uh, twisted bileographene, and I believe the next talk is closely related. Jed Pixley will give the second talk about some closely related physics. So, Oscar. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Um, this work uh, was done uh, at the National High Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee and Florida State University and was supported by uh, the U.S. National Science Foundation. Uh, Jian Kang is my collaborator. He is a postdoc at the Magnet Lab. And this talk <clears throat> will be mostly based on uh, this preprint, which was recently uh, accepted for uh, peer-reviewed publication. So let me start by describing the system. Imagine two monolayer graphene uh, sitting on top of each other, and then you twist uh, one of them uh, by uh, an angle theta. Uh, if this angle is small and commensurate, you will uh, generate a new periodic uh, pattern on top of the underlying atomic periodicity of each individual monolayer, and this new periodic potential will then reconstruct the plane waves that were the valence or conduction electrons of the individual graphene, the famous Dirac cones. Okay? So because of this reconstruction, there will be new uh, uh, band uh, openings uh, there will be new, smaller Brillouin zone, because in real space, this is a larger uh, unit cell. Um, and now we can talk about filling these mini bands in this so-called Moiré Brillouin zone. By the way, this pattern uh, is called the Moiré uh, pattern. So as you can imagine, if this angle gets smaller and smaller, this uh, pattern gets larger and larger wavelength. Um, and um, uh, in, in principle, we are now uh, uh, in a qualitatively new regime from the uh, original monolayer uh, graphene physics. Now, of course, uh, this field has uh, seen remarkable development uh, since the announcement at the APS March meeting uh, by uh, Pablo uh, Herrero Harero group from uh, MIT. Uh, of uh, uh, rather remarkable uh, effects. So let me just walk you through the results and then try to put it in a perspective of what I just uh, discussed. So on, on the top uh, uh, graph, the x-axis is the carrier concentration measured relative to the neutrality point of graphene. Um, at that point, the uh, conductance uh, shows uh, a dip, but it doesn't go to zero. So we are dealing with uh, possibly a semi-metal there. As we increase the carrier concentration, uh, at first the conductance goes down, but then in uh, a small window of carrier concentration, there is a sharp suppression uh, of conductance uh, and uh, actually an insulating behavior unless you look at very, very low temperatures, uh, uh, where in some of the samples uh, it can become superconductive, in some others uh, it's not, um, and it basically be becomes uh, insulating. And then if you uh, dope uh, near this point, uh, superconductivity comes in. And if you dope too much, you empty some band because you enter into uh, an insulator. Now, uh, similar uh, effects happen on both the electron and hole doped uh, side of this uh, system. So uh, experimentalists uh, argue that the insulating state that happens between the neutrality point and this point, where, by the way, we would have uh, four electrons uh, in the unit cell that span this doping range, that this insulating state um, uh, happens at commensurate filling. If it happens at commensurate filling, presumably this is happening because of some strong uh, uh, correlation effects 
Um, and the natural way to think about this problem is then to start thinking about uh, the interaction energy as being the dominant term in the Hamiltonian, ask what kind of an insulating state they would stabilize, and then we then turn on the hopping as a perturbation to see which one of the multitude of uh, insulating states, uh, many body insulating states, get selected. Okay? So the natural first step in a theoretical analysis would be to understand what kind of Vanier states uh, we can write down for these four bands, and then start thinking about what kind of insulating uh, many body states we could uh, generate. So this talk is about the first part of it. Uh, it turns out that the Vanier states um, are highly non-trivial, and uh, uh, there is some debate about exactly how to construct them. So I'd like to walk you through uh, those arguments. Uh, this talk will, at this point, have nothing to do with strong correlations, although it is motivated by trying to understand the strongly correlated behavior. Okay, so how should we think about this problem? Uh, imagine that the blue is the large Brillouin zone of the top layer. The red is the large Brillouin zone of the bottom layer. They're twisted relative to each other, and therefore the Dirac cones are not exactly on top of each other. Now, uh, if the uh, twist angle is uh, commensurate, we will have a new Brillouin zone, the Moray Brillouin zone, and these two uh, Dirac points will fold into the corners of this new uh, Brillouin zone. And similarly, the opposite, and so this is coming from one valley, and similarly from the opposite valley, uh, the uh, Dirac cones will fold into, uh, into the same uh, point. Okay, now, uh, because we have some interlayer coupling, this will introduce band hybridizations, um, and therefore will reconstruct the uh, band structure. And it for some for some special values of these angles for the um, uh, experimentally, uh, uh, well, for the for the, for the realistic coupling between the layers, uh, it was predicted theoretically uh, some time ago before this was discovered that some of these bands that you generate can become very very thin uh, in energy. And there were so-called speci special magic angles where some of these bands get very, very, very thin. Uh, and I will try to make this uh, uh, precise. And so once you have a thin band, you have these narrow bands, you would expect that the correlation effects, the uh, many body effects, play uh, some important role. Um, okay, so that's, that's sort of the basic uh, playground uh, in which uh, I would like to discuss uh, the physics. Okay, and so uh, in terms of those uh, bands, uh, well, there are, uh, not including spin, four of them. Uh, well, this would be uh, uh, the, the top of that uh, four-band structure, and this would be the bottom. So these two are presumably the, uh, the trivial uh, band insulators, and everything in between, uh, if you have an insulator, should be interesting. It should be due to many body effects. Uh, so this, uh, in particular, would be happening for two electrons or two holes per Moray unit cell, okay? So strictly speaking, that's actually quarter filling. Okay, so to build these Vanier states, what we uh, considered is uh, the following structure. We started from uh, a monolayer, uh, let's say described uh, by uh, the, the red, uh, which is the bottom layer, and then the blue, which is the top layer, and then we twist uh, the top one by some angle theta over two, the bottom one by minus theta over two, um, and then we introduce interlayer coupling uh, between them. Now, we start from a situation in which the atoms here were in registry, and we twist about this uh, position. And we ask, what kind of point group symmetries does this uh, new uh, crystal have? Well, it's periodic, because the angle was chosen to be commensurate. Um, it has a threefold rotational symmetry around the uh, stacked site, the carbon registered site. It also has a twofold rotational symmetry, which is perpendicular to this main uh, axis. So imagine rotating uh, in the plane of the two uh, monolayers by 180 degrees, it will bring the structure back into itself. And this generates uh, the rest of the group, which in this case, the point group is so called D3. Okay. Um, so as I said, uh, we start with the situation where and end with a situation where the so-called AA sites are in registry. Now we can uh, get to the end of this uh, unit cell in two different ways. We can either track 
the blue lattice and the triangular uh, 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 unit cell vectors uh, uh, of, of, the, of the top monolayer as well as the bottom monolayer, we have to come to the same point. And so uh, this commensurate uh, structure is therefore described by how many times you go along each of these uh, legs. Uh, and so a pair of integers, M and N, defines, the, uh, defines this commensurate structure and the twist angle. Okay? So we will be referring then to uh, this pair of integers. Okay, so if these uh, are uh, 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 some small numbers, well, uh, then your unit cell will be small. If these are large numbers, a little bit offset from each other, then your unit cell can be actually quite large. Okay, so um, many of these band structures have been calculated before the discovery of the uh, correlated uh, effects. And the band structure uh, uh, that uh, we calculate, uh, we calculate from the uh, model that was uh, published, for example, in uh, Moon and Koshino's uh, paper. And it is essentially a tie binding model for this large uh, unit cell where the hopping amplitudes, which can be within a layer, uh, either top or bottom, or between the layers are dis described by a two-parameter uh, 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 family of functions. These are fixed uh, experimentally, um, as well as the rest of the coefficients to match the LDA calculation for the uh, uh, large twist angle, so small unit cell, where the LDA calculation can actually be done. So this, has, so this type banding model uh, has been calibrated Unfortunately, the LDA calculation for the realistic uh, magic angle uh, is too costly. And so uh, uh, the, the best that one has to actually compute the band structure microscopically is to fit these type binding coefficients uh, for, uh, for larger angles uh, to LDA. They work there, and then you just extrapolate to small twist angle. So that's what we did. We, we used these to compute the band structure. Um, and uh, as you can see, the progression, for example, uh, as shown in their paper of these angles uh, and the set of integers that they show uh, is shown here. So once you have these larger uh, integers, you can see there's a new uh, pattern that, uh, clearly new pattern that emerges. Okay. Now, uh, it turns out that the experimentally observed, yes, please. Not, not, not be able to extrapolate these, this thing, right? Or maybe well, I they're it. apparently there, so experimentally. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So now, experimentally, it turns out that the magic angle is close to 1.06 or so as, uh, uh, as uh, measured. Um, and if you use this model uh, to calculate the uh, band structure at that angle, the closest commensurate integers, uh, uh, simple integers, um, to that would be uh, 30 and 31. Uh, it turns out that for 30 and 31, th this model gives band structure, which indeed g gives four bands, but these four bands are not separated from the rest of the spectrum uh, from, I think, from the bottom. Um, and so as a result, one doesn't actually get an insulator, as one should, uh, uh, at, uh, at the bottom of these bands. Now, people who add relaxation to this claim that, uh, uh, that in fact, that uh, does produce the gaps from the top uh, and the bottom, but uh, we were just simply taking the unrelaxed, um, uh, unrelaxed uh, uh, model. Now, if you want to understand the qualitative effects, like the shapes of the Vanier orbitals, et cetera, um, well, uh, I think you are justified in taking a pair of integers which is large enough, although not necessarily exactly at the magic angle, where this kind of model does give you bands that are separated. And that turns out to be true for 25 and 26. So uh, this, uh, band uh, the, uh, this uh, unit cell contains now something like uh, almost 8,000 uh, sites, not quite the 11,000 sites that uh, they are there for 30 and 31, but close enough. But qualitatively now you can reproduce these gaps. Okay. So the band structure that we get from here looks something like this. Um, and uh, I will discuss uh, its details uh, uh, in a moment. Now, if we were to zoom in at the gamma point, which is the center of the moray brillouin zone, we would find that the two top energy states are degenerate. And if we check how they transform under the threefold rotation, 
they form uh, a doublet. They, they, they transform as an E representation of the D3 group. The same is true at the bottom of, uh, of this band structure. On the other hand, if we zoom in to the corners of the Brillouin zone, the uh, mini, uh, the more K and K prime, there we see one doublet, and this uh, indeed uh, transforms as, uh, as a doublet under rotations, uh, but then we see split uh, pair of uh, bands, and these are one-dimensional representations, uh, A2 and A1. So now, the, now we have a uh, setup that we can try to build our Vanier states for. We have a gap that separates uh, our four bands from the top and from the bottom, and so in principle, we should just be able to uh, construct such uh, exponentially localized Vanier states. Now, if before you computed the Vanier states, you looked at the block states, and from the block states, you computed the local density of states, let's say for positive energy, you would discover that this local density of states is peaked at a series of uh, triangle lattice sites, the Moray triangle lattice sites. So this naively suggests that the uh, Vanier states should um, be centered around the triangle lattice sites. So perhaps you have some type of a triangle lattice uh, Hubbard model or something like that. And there are people who try to uh, argue for this kind of uh, reasoning. Uh, I, I will argue too that this is in fact incorrect. This was also pointed out by uh, others. Let me present the argument for that. So uh, let us assume that we indeed have four Vanier states uh, associated with the triangle lattice sites. Now let's say that these Vanier states are chosen to have a corresponding site symmetry of the D3 group. So if there is a point group operation that now acts on these Vanier states, um, there will be uh, some uh, unitary matrix which uh, transforms between our set of four states that depends on which symmetry we picked. Now, uh, if we construct block states out of these uh, Vanier states in the usual way and then act with this symmetry operation, we discover that if we pick triangle lattice sites, uh, then the block states would have to transform the same way, so this matrix U has to be the same, uh, as the uh, uh, Vanier states at high symmetry points, the points which get uh, mapped onto themselves due to these uh, point group operations. That turns out to be a problem because uh, once you fix your Vanier states, uh, you fix this matrix, and what this is telling us is that at high symmetry points which map onto themselves, such, let's say under threefold rotation, such as the gamma point and the corners of the Brillouin zone, this matrix has to be the same. Uh, but I just showed you that at the gamma point we have two E representations, two doublets, and at the K point we have one doublet and two separated states. So uh, this is therefore inconsistent. Uh, um, so as I said, the representations at gamma and K according to this uh, would have to be identical, but they are not. So this suggests, oh, and the similar argument was presented by uh, Liang Fu's uh, group and then uh, Sentil and Ashwin Vishwanath's uh, group before, although it was a slightly different argument. And so this suggests that we should uh, not think of this as a triangle lattice, despite the fact that the local density of states is peaked on the Moray triangle lattice, but rather as a honeycomb lattice, the dual lattice of the uh, triangle lattice. Now it turns out that this argument uh, doesn't quite go through the same way if we pick those uh, sites, because now under some of the point group operations, let's say rotation around this point, you see some of these uh, uh, Vanier states, they change uh, position. You're, not longer, you're no longer rotating around the triangle uh, site, and they go into different uh, unit cells. That's why under this operation, uh, there's an additional shift. The shift depends on which atom you're considering and which point group operation. That's why R prime depends on G and I. So now if you follow uh, the logic I presented on the previous slide and ask how do the block states transform, you discover that they don't actually quite transform the same way. There's an additional phase factor that you pick up. And this phase factor depends on this shift, R prime. Now notice that this does not matter at gamma because at gamma, K is equal to zero and this factor is just one. And so at gamma, the block states should transform the same way as the Vanier states. Uh, and I told you that the block states are two E's uh, and therefore, we should construct our Vanier states in such a way that they transform as E under the point group operation, uh, the site operations. But because at the K point, this factor does, no, does not longer uh, disappear, 
it's present, we have the desired results that the representations at gamma and k need not be identical anymore. Okay, so to construct our value in states, we're gonna focus on the gamma point where uh, this factor is not present. Um, and because the uh, threefold rotation around the z-axis uh, at the uh, uh, AA uh, registered uh, point does not change the sublattice of, of the honeycomb uh, lattice, uh, the Vanier states must, must transform the same way as the block states. And so this means that U must be diagonal for G uh, that is C3, so for the uh, threefold rotation. Okay, um, and so now let's imagine that we apply C3 here and then ask what, ha uh, what happens. Well, let us um, pick the one one element of our diagonal matrix to be a, a phase factor uh, with two pi over three uh, rotation. So uh, that would fix the transformation properties of our, of our first Vanier state, W1. But once we have W1, you see, we can then uh, apply time reversal symmetry and that doesn't change the site, it will generate a new state, uh, let's call this W2. Uh, and because under time inversal symmetry, this phase factor will change uh, sign, that gives us the second element of our di diagonal matrix. Now, to get W3, this is uh, generated by a rotation uh, uh, around this dashed line. Uh, well, we're just gonna be taken from one honeycomb sublattice, uh, more honeycomb sub sublattice to the other. Um, and it also tells us exactly uh, how that new Vanier states, W3, should transform under threefold rotation. That's fixed for us, this phase is now fixed for us. And similarly, or lastly, to get the fourth Vanier state, we just apply time reversal symmetry to W3, uh, and that forces this phase, phase factor to be this. Okay, so uh, now what do our block states uh, look like at the gamma point? I'm plotting the absolute value squared um, for the top energy state uh, at gamma, which uh, transforms uh, under rotation such that it picks up a phase two pi uh, over three. Uh, this is separated into the top layer uh, and sublattice A and B and the bottom layer and sublattice A, A and B. So it has this peculiar, if you wish, propeller-like uh, structure. Similarly, but it's smooth uh, other than that. Um, if you uh, similarly look at the uh, block state uh, uh, below, in, in the doublet below, which transform as, uh, uh, as epsilon also, the, has rotation um, uh, eigenvalue with the phase two pi uh, over three, then, Uh, th this site, I'm sorry, yes, uh, this site is the AA site, the, the, the corner here. So that would be the triangle lattice. Is it the same? Uh, same, yeah, this, this, is, this is a triangle lattice. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, okay, so this is what the block states look like. Now, we're gonna use these block states, this is just to give you a feel for the, what they look like, we're gonna use these block states to construct our Vanier states. Now, the method for constructing uh, Vanier states uh, was developed by uh, Marzari and Vanderbilt uh, uh, and to optimize their spread, and we just simply follow that uh, method. Um, uh, perhaps I can walk you very quickly through how this works. Uh, remember, the Vanier states are related to block states by Fourier transformation. Now, numerically, when you compute the block states, uh, there is nothing that fixes the phase of the block state at one K point and the nearby K point. And so as a, uh, as a result of that, numerically, or in practice, this um, block state will um, have a random phase in K space, or at least that phase will not necessarily be smooth. And that presents a problem because when you Fourier transform that uh, non-smooth function in K, you will not necessarily generate something that is nice and localized in real space. Uh, so you would like to make this block state uh, as smooth as possible in K because that would then produce as uh, localized of a Vanier state as possible. Okay, so the way this is done is that you start with some trial functions. Uh, in the case of an isolated band, just a single trial function. Uh, that's usually something that has some uh, nice smooth peak, and, uh, but it should have the right symmetry of the band if you like to reproduce that. And then you project that onto the Hilbert space at a particular K point spanned by your isolated band. This is done this way. Uh, this uh, defines your new basis uh, which, um, which lives in the correct subspace of the uh, block state you are interested in and has an additional advantage that it is smooth in K because this projector is smooth in K. So if you have a random phase here, well, the random phase here exactly cancels that. So that defines our, uh, at this point, complex uh, K-dependent uh, term. And to normalize it, at, uh, 
is trivial if you have a single band. Okay, uh, now uh, in the case, this is not our case because we have four bands. These four bands are sort of uh, intermingled, but they're separated from the rest of the bands by a gap. So uh, instead of uh, just taking one of them, we're gonna consider uh, all four uh, uh, block states. Uh, we're going to find a linear combination of them, and we try to make this linear combination uh, as smooth as possible uh, in k-space. Okay, so there's a procedure for this. Uh, you have to find the single value decomposition of the overlap matrix uh, of these uh, states, uh, and from there uh, find the uh, square root of an inverse uh, of this, but this is a well-documented procedure, okay? So, as long as this inverse exists, uh, in other words, none of the single value decomposition uh, eigenvalues vanish anywhere in Brillouin zone, then this procedure can be done and there is no obstruction to building these Vanier states. Okay, so this is what we follow. Um, to get a good uh, trial state, we uh, picked the, we construct them as following. We just take these block states and then we uh, imagine uh, them centered around the dual, the honeycomb lattice sites, um, and we're just simply going to take a uh, wave function that lives in here uh, on the top layer uh, and sublattice A, uh, so from the top energy state and from the bottom and uh, sublattice B, and then mix in a state that lives in the different energy, the bottom uh, doublet, but they're both coming from the same C3 eigenvalues, so that now our block state, even though it's mixed in energy, uh, sorry, now our Vanier state, even though it's mixed in energy, transforms under rotations uh, uh, as it should. It should pick up an epsilon and should be an eigenstate. Um, and so then we mix in these two together. That gives us our trial state. We fit into this machinery, uh, go through the single value decomposition, and outcome um, the, uh, uh, the Vanier state after the so-called projection method. Now, one can do a little bit better than that. One can uh, try to f then optimize these unitary matrices uh, that you still have a freedom of acting with the unitary matrix and try to get the spread of these Vanier functions to be as small as possible. This was developed by uh, Marzari and uh, Vanderbilt, the so-called maximally localized uh, Vanier functions. And, um, and you can do that. You will achieve about 20% improvement uh, in, the, uh, in the spread. Now, what do these functions look like? So remember, they're all centered on the uh, honeycomb lattice, so the dual lattice of the triangle lattice. But interestingly enough, they all have three peaks, which are centered approximately on the triangle lattice. So this uh, immediately explained how you're going to recover the um, uh, local density of states from something that is uh, centered at the uh, honeycomb lattice, uh, uh, but while the density of states is peaked on the triangle lattice. Okay, um, and I can tell you more about these if you are interested, but from the, uh, once you build these Vanier functions, they live in the uh, correct subspace of interest in these four flat or near, nearly flat bands, and then you can sandwich the original Hamiltonian in this basis and compute your type binding Hamiltonian from that. Yes, this shows the triangle lattice. Uh, just consider the middle of these triangles. That is the honeycomb lattice. That is the Moray honeycomb lattice. Pretty close to that, yes. Um, yeah. Triangle lattice. The block state. Yeah. But this is just a gamma point. Remember, you, you, you sum over all Brillouin zone. Uh, so once you project it and then uh, do the integrals uh, uh, with the projectors throughout the Brillouin zone, this is the structure you pick up. See? So it naturally explains the, the, the peaks in local density of states. Uh, and it uh, doesn't suffer from this uh, uh, issue of the symmetry mismatch. Okay. So, uh, so the story here, therefore, is once you pick W1 to be the eigenstate of C3, uh, you can generate uh, W2 by time reversal, W3 by C2 prime, which is the two-fold rotation I discussed, W4, um, and uh, uh, by time reversal of this one. Okay, so all the symmetries that I discussed, the exact symmetries of the D3 structure, are therefore represented locally 
uh, in these binary states. And uh, so how well can you do with this? Uh, well, uh, this is how well it reproduces the original band structure just from the type binding model of these Vanier, of these Vanier states. Uh, the blue uh, is computed from the uh, Vanier-based type binding, uh, and the red is the original uh, type binding uh, problem with uh, almost 8,000 sites. Okay. Um, okay, now uh, I hope I have another hour to discuss the relation to the obstruction that has been discussed uh, 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 in, this, in this field. Um, uh, and so let me just uh, tell you how this is related to this. So um, uh, let me start with the claim. Uh, the, the claim uh, is that if the system has a twofold rotational symmetry around the z-axis, followed by uh, time reversal symmetry, and then in addition to that, it has a valid conservation symmetry, um, then uh, there's an obstruction to prevent, to constructing exponentially localized states, uh, uh, exponentially localized Vanier functions, which are symmetric, in other words, which transform locally under the uh, operations uh, of the crystal, okay? So uh, by symmetric, I mean represent the crystalline time reversal and valley symmetries locally. So the question is, how are we avoiding this uh, uh, obstruction? So uh, this argument has been, uh, quite an insightful uh, uh, argument has been uh, uh, pointed out by uh, Sentil and uh, Vishwanath collaboration. Um, so uh, where, does this, uh, where does this come from? How does one understand this? So um, imagine for just a second that we are going to conserve the number of particles in a particular valley. Um, uh, so now you twist the two layers and so naively because the two Dirac cones in the uh, moray brillouin zone come from nearby valleys at small angle. Uh, in the one valley problem, their winding numbers should be the same because the winding number of uh, this is presumably the same as the winding number of uh, this on the other layer. Uh, and so the in the band structure, if you now get the two uh, Dirac cones uh, for each valley separately, then uh, they, should be, uh, they should have an equal winding number. This is not the situation for each monolayer. In each monolayer, the winding number at the corner of the Brillouin zone, uh, k and minus k, are opposite. But here the claim is that they are the same. Um, I just uh, made it uh, clear that this is just a very naive uh, uh, argument, but it, it is a lot more subtle, but it's actually a correct conclusion. Um, so um, now remember, for, for this to work, you need to have a uh, two-fold rotational symmetry around the z-axis. That uh, is true if you combine the twofold rotation axis that we have present in our structure, and then an additional twofold rotation axis that's perpendicular to that, but still in the plane of the, uh, uh, of the uh, bilayer. So it's only if we have this additional C2 double prime combined with C2 prime that the twofold rotation is, uh, is present. Now, uh, uh, to establish that the winding number is the same, uh, is not still enough to establish obstruction. Um, for that, one, uh, as uh, they have done, uh, uh, argued that in some open region, uh, in the single uh, valley band structure that surrounds the corners of the Brillouin zone, one can define a K-smooth basis on the two narrow bands, um, and that in this basis, the structure of the effective Hamiltonian has to look like this. In other words, it doesn't contain sigma-3 matrix. And then what one can ask is, uh, because it's now a smooth field, uh, how do the components of this field wind as you go around these two direct points? Um, and uh, in the presence of the additional two-fold rotational symmetry, uh, the, uh, the, the point in the middle between K and K prime, so the end point, uh, turns out to have uh, block states which are eigenstates of this um, two-fold rotation uh, symmetry with opposite eigenvalues. With that, it is enough to show that uh, uh, N1 under a mirror, uh, sorry, under a two-fold rotation uh, operation that goes through the endpoints and therefore takes one to the other, um, one direct point to the other. Under that operation, it turns out that N1 does not change sign, so the, uh, the X component of this uh, phase field uh, will stay, but the Y component changes sign. So if you were to plot the zeros of these uh, two functions, 
uh, under this uh, symmetry, uh, it turns out that they would have to have the same winding number. Now, uh, so uh, these, two, uh, uh, these two components of the argument not only force the phase field to lie in the xy plane, but they also show that the winding numbers are the same. And there are, but there are no periodic functions, n1 and n2, that you could now extend throughout the entire Brillouin zone, which would have two same winding numbers in the entire Brillouin zone, but only two. In other words, you would have to accompany that with opposite winding numbers. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, basis of the, uh, uh, essentially, a proof that there has to be an obstruction to building exponentially uh, uh, localized Vanier states, provided that the valley symmetry, which we needed uh, to define this, and C to T are good symmetries. Um, OK, now it turns out that in the D3 structure, the C to the prime is not an exact symmetry. And because of that, the C to T, neither is C to T. And so therefore, our, if, we, if we did have valley um, uh, uh, number conservation, um, uh, then our effective Hamiltonian would have to be two, be two by two, but it could contain, sorry about this typo, but it could contain the uh, sigma three matrix. And that immediately uh, tips this vector out of plane and there's no longer any obstruction. The obstruction only works if this is in plane. Moreover, because we are on a lattice, the U1 valley symmetry is not exact. So there is some mixing between the two different uh, valleys. So neither uh, the valley symmetry is exact uh, uh, in the microscopic construction that, that I showed you, uh, uh, nor the two-fold rotation symmetry followed by time reversal along the uh, z-axis uh, uh, are exact, and therefore there's actually no obstruction. Um, and so in practice, uh, when we look at our Vanier states after the projection, but before the, uh, uh, but before Vanier 90, which is essentially the maximal localization, uh, we find that a significant portion of the uh, uh, wave numbers that compose our Vanier states are actually coming from one valley, but there is some spillage into the other valley. Uh, in this case, it's something like 9 to 1. Uh, and if we then maximally localize it, then it's something like 5 to 1. So never do you have a perfect valley polarization. Um, I'd like to connect this to um, uh, uh, the so-called ob uh, obstruction uh, uh, issue that uh, has been uh, discussed by Solyanov and uh, David Vanderbilt in the case of 2D topological insulators. So it is, it is known uh, that there is an obstruction to building uh, exponential uh, Vanier states if you have a separated band, but that band has a finite churn number. Now, Z2 topological insulators do not break time error symmetry, so they don't have churn numbers. So the question was, uh, is there any obstruction in this case? Uh, the immediate answer is that there shouldn't be because uh, you don't have churn numbers. But it turns out that if you try to build um, exponentially localized Vanier states in the 2D uh, topological insulator with a Z2 index that's odd, um, and you require your Vanier functions to respect the time reverse symmetry locally, then there is an obstruction. So you have to relax uh, this uh, uh, condition that the two Vanier states come in Kramer's pairs. Um, and that's because, uh, loosely speaking, the basis that composes uh, your Hilbert space at the two different uh, K points uh, is completely orthogonal. Um, and so it's actually quite related, but there is a way around it uh, that they proposed, which is that you simply uh, pick up something that does not, uh, you pick up Vanier states which don't go into each other uh, uh, locally, uh, they're not Kramer's pairs under time reverse. Uh, okay, so I think I don't have enough time to talk about uh, uh, what happens uh, to this band structure as you start twisting the angle uh, closer and closer to the uh, precise magic angle. They're actually quadratic band touchings. Uh, that in itself has many body instabilities, but let me just uh, uh, stop here and uh, flash my conclusions. So thank you for your attention.